<laughs> I'd like to call tonight's meeting to order December 7th, 2023, the Cupertino Union School District Board of Education. Welcome everyone. Little history lesson. Today is December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. 1941, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii was bombed, and that was the America's entrance into World War II. And at that time, the then president, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, said it was a day that will live in infamy. And indeed, he was right. So welcome, everyone. Glad to have you here. And we're going to start with roll call. Trustee Manhattan. Here. Trustee Chow. Here. Trustee Liu. Here. Trustee Vogel. Here. Trustee Leon. Absent. And next item is board agenda approval. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Satish. I'll second. Thank you, Jerry. Roll call vote. <laughs> Trustee Manhattan. Aye. Trustee Chow. Aye. Trustee Liu. Aye. And Trustee Vogel. Aye. Next, we have the flag salute. And I believe we have two students here who are going to lead the flag salute for us. And that would be Lauren and Ishnavi. Am I right? Please come forward to the microphone for us. Thank you. Everyone rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Lauren and Ishnabi. Next item is our school presentation. One of the best things we do on the board is to hear presentations from our schools. So I'd like to introduce Jean Wang, um, our pre the principal of CMS, welcome. Um, hello everyone. I first would like to thank the board um, in allowing us to be here tonight. And I'd like to thank our executive cabinet. I am absolutely thrilled and I'm so honored to share with all of you our small but mighty yearbook staff at CMS. And they are absolutely incredible. And you can see we're dressed out today to show you all of our school wear um, that represents all of our students and where they feel they belong and what they're a part of. Thanks. Um, I also like to introduce Mrs. Alexis Sharp, who is our CMS teacher that teaches sixth grade English language arts, social studies and bridge. And she is also our yearbook teacher for this school year. Alexis and I have known each other for a very long time. And what I love and appreciate so much about her is her energy, her passion, her kindness, and the love that she puts forth in all that she does. And so when I first met her in elementary school, and I believe we were looking at a first grade class, and then a third grade class, and then a fifth grade class, and then here we are together again at middle school. And to see that love and care that she provides the young children out to our middle schoolers is amazing. And I am so excited for our students to share with you what they are doing at CMS. So... Mrs. Sharp. Good evening. I am Alexis Sharp. I am at Cupertino Middle School and I am the yearbook teacher. With me is the CMS yearbook staff. We are 11 students and we are mighty. These, <laughs> these students are creating an epic legacy, the CMS yearbook, and they will present their slides, introducing themselves first and everything that they do that is CMS yearbook. Hello, my name is Mako, and this is Yearbook Highlights. 
So for deadline celebrations, we have a special celebration after finishing our first deadline and we had a pizza party. <clears throat> Food Fridays. So every Friday, Ms. Sharp provides the whole yearbook staff with some snacks and many yearbook staff look forward for this day. Golden Quill. Every month we have a caption writing competition that relates to our yearbook and the best caption writer gets a golden quill from Ms. Sharp. <laughs> Lastly, free access. Yearbook staff has yearbook access, special access to go to school events for free and not waiting in line. These social events include winter socials and Halloween socials. Um, hi, my name is Saloni and this is our yearbook theme. The, this school year's yearbook theme is Coloring Outside the Lines. This theme was chosen to, to show how unique and diverse CMSs. It was also chosen to represent how students break stereotypes and highlight their individuality. Hi, I'm Lauren. And um, your book is really important because we're not only just a fun book of pictures and text and art, but we're the legacy of the school year. We capture important moments, showcase students, and encourage the students to look back at the year and remember all the memories that they've made. Photos. Photos are a huge component of the yearbook because they help explain the story. They also help explain what the captions are about and tell what is going on. This year, we used our newly funded drone and DSLR cameras to take our pictures. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Hi, my name is Yashita, and I'm going to say that elements have a photo. These are the traits that we use the most while capturing a picture. Exposure. Exposure is the amount of light captured while taking a picture. Changing the exposure helps the picture make visible and more brighter. The rule of thirds. Rule of thirds cuts a picture into thirds, each part. Having the subject of the photo aligned with the grid and creates interest to the reader. Action, reaction, motion, and emotion. These are the elements that we aim to capture in a picture. Action and motion, they create a detail in a movement, while the reaction and emotion comes right after. Uh, hi, my name is Michael, um, and these are interviews. Interviews are when we ask students and staff about uh, questions about themselves and other different questions. By doing so, we can learn more about their interests and experiences at CMS. <laughs> when making an interview, you need to aim for two to four sentences. Um, do not add text in the gutter, which is where uh, like the it's the middle of the page. Uh, don't change the quotes. Have the quotes and honest quotes uh, from the uh, person that you're interviewing. Note information like the name, date, and place. Hi, I'm Constance, and I'm going to talk about copy. Copy is a paragraph on the page that it usually com contains a story and interests the reader. Copy has three main elements. First is the hook, which is usually a question, a quote, or a scene to draw the reader in. The body, part, the body, the main body of the paragraph then continues the scene further and adds extra information about the topic. And lastly, the conclusion gives the whole paragraph some closure and connects everything back to the hook and the headline. This is a mod. It's an extra feature to the yearbook that is meant to be entertaining and uh, exciting to read. It can be, for example, in this example, it can be an interview, a Q&A, a pie chart, or some other sort of graph. Each spread, which is about two page, which is two pages, and you see two pages at once, contains about one to two mods. Elements of a mod. Interview mods consist of interview photos, title, the title, and interview responses. Other mods, such as polls, consist of the title and the poll responses. Hello, I'm Arohi, and here is the hours we spent in eDesign. eDesign is basically where we make spreads at two, for our yearbook, and we worked about eight, 800 hours in total. Um, it's like a line graph. 
Uh, hi, my name is Ethan. I'm going to talk about our Hall of Fame slides. And so um, in total, there are 12 of us, 11 staffers and one teacher. And we make up one, less than 1% of the whole school, but we're making a book that will go to 99% of it. And we're all each known for something like veteran, the drone pilot, or the food guy. <laughs> <laughs> So this is memories so far. Um, on the top left, it's a photo of us using the drone. The photo next to it is the boys in our class picking out a snack on Food Fridays. And the photo right next to it is our photography teacher at CMS teaching us about cameras. On the bottom left is a photo of the boys basketball press conference. A press conference is when we get together to like take photos of sports. On the photo next to it is Miss Sharp teaching us all about yearbook and things we need to learn about it. And the photo on the right is a photo of the girls at the press conference. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you. We, we'd like to take a picture so would we in our drone so oh, oh. oh. So you're off okay. the slide, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> we do that before we gather for a picture or do you want us to gather first we would love to gather and get you all okay together. and and, and the kids and the uh, okay let's go in the middle here <laughs> moving along to classified employee of the month mike Thank Okay. Well, um, our honoree is not not able to make it today, so I'll just tell him I don't have one. Make you stand up. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Our uh, classified honoree wasn't able to be here today, so I'll read the uh, the nomination and. Uh, We'll give this person a hand and then we'll move on. So our classified employee of the month is Cheryl Morgan, an IA gen ed from McAuliffe. And the folks who nominated her said, Cheryl <clears throat> has been essential in the classroom for the last five years. She's been the stabilizing influence through teachers being out on a long-term absence, retirements and transitions. She has aided two teachers so far just this year with transitioning them into the classroom and helping them get to know the kids. The second grade program and the parent aides. She's amazing with the students, always calm and patient. Cheryl excels uh, with educating uh, the aiding parents in their tasks and how they can best help the teacher or sub. Her flexibility and reliability through all the changes in her class have been extraordinary. She has welcomed each teacher and student with open arms and an open heart. Cheryl is very grounded in the McAuliffe philosophy. Uh, she has been an IA McAuliffe since 2003, but her adult children also attend McAuliffe. She's always a team player and a pleasure to work with. She truly helps to guide each teacher on their path to success in McAuliffe. Uh, congratulations to Cheryl Morgan. Congratulations, Cheryl. And we also have a certificate from Evan Lowe's office for you and the superintendent will have those and we'll see that uh, she gets them. So congratulations and thank you, Mike. Next item is communication employee organizations. Erin, do we have anyone speaking today? We do. We have CEA President Kate Lee. Okay. Hey, welcome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening. Um, tonight, uh, CEA is focusing on elementary school, and um, you'll be hearing from some of our elementary school teachers um, and getting some emails from them as well to help you understand what it's like in our classrooms right now for um, at elementary schools. Uh, and our, I'd like to introduce Chris Rolls, who is our primary um, director, um, which covers TK through second, right? Um, unfortunately, Marianne Cunningham, who is our 
upper grade director is unable to make it tonight um, and wasn't able to give me something to read for her. But I would just say in general, um, the upper grade teachers are really appreciating the the lowering of numbers of so the class sizes, I know contractually next year is the year that that kicks in, but the, the effort that the district made to start that process, um, they're able to, they're really noticing that they're able to reach more of their students than when we had the higher numbers of 33. So really appreciate that. And I would probably say the thing that um, they would like to see more of is some, um, something to help them with student behavior that seems to be pretty strong and, and is disruptive of the learning process in, in our classrooms right now. And also more supports in the classroom is maybe extending that um, interventions that we started, that we've started in the foundational primary grades up into elementary grades, because we have some students that could really use it there too. And for now, I will introduce Chris. Chris has been a, t a fixture and a wonderful um, Per, uh, person in our district teaching for 26 years. He's been at Murdoch Portel. He's taught kindergarten all the way through fifth grade. And um, so he really understands both right now, he's our primary director, but he also understands the challenges and the joys of upper grade as well. So he'll be speaking to you about primary tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. All right, yeah. uh, I have to take some credit for Chris. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and, this, and so does Leslie. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I've got a lot of mentoring from these two people, for sure. Um, well, good evening. My name is Chris Rolls, and I am a, a second and third grade teacher at Murdoch Portal Elementary School, and serving this year as a primary director for CEA. And I'm also the parent of two CUSD students. Uh, in my 26th year of teaching, I still really enjoy the positive energy and enthusiasm that my students bring to school each day. They look forward to their lively interactions with their peers and their teachers, and they love to share what they're capable of doing with our support and encouragement. Our district has done much over the last couple of years to give our students a greater chance of academic success in several areas. Uh, support for English language learners, regular reading intervention sessions for those in need, the return of phonics as an important component in reading and writing development, and consistent music instruction for second and third grade students with credentialed instructors. Like any organization, our school district also has some things to work on if we want our kids to live and learn in a positive, kind, and caring environment. For example, supporting our students and teachers at the youngest grade levels should be critical. A great start in school sets a pattern for life. Facilities for our TK programs are inadequate in terms of their equipment, and there does not really seem to be a long range plan for the overall TK program across the district. In addition, the inability to implement a music program at this level for kids means <laughs> no un uninterrupted prep time for their teachers. The social and emotional well-being of our students is another area of concern for our teachers. Student behavior in many classes is poor, and the time and energy that goes into classroom management for the safety and well-being of our kids has never been greater. Even with intervention strategies to combat the problems that arise, teachers still find themselves unable to provide a nurturing learning environment for all. One contributing factor may be the severe lack of behaviorists and IAs to support the students with IEPs. For those cases where a student has reacted violently in the classroom, there needs to be a clear process of reporting <coughs> student assaults. We all need to consider whether the pressure to be academically successful is depriving our students of the time and opportunity to practice the social skills necessary to cultivate satisfying family relationships and friendships in a relaxed and carefree manner. The teachers in Cupertino believe that supported educators equals successful students. And when the district is responsive to our needs inside and outside the classroom, we can truly excel as educators. We must work together so that our students can be knowledgeable, happy, well-adjusted individuals who will work for the good of all. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Chris. Okay, next on the agenda is um, public comment. 
This is a time for the public to uh, share information with us, items that are not on the agenda. Do we have anyone tonight, Erin? We do, we have three speakers. Okay, uh, The for the three speakers, before we introduce you, uh, the guidelines are that we will not respond to comment, but if you have questions, someone from the staff will get back to you and you will have three minutes. So Erin, would you like to call our first speaker? Yes, our first speaker is Christy Evans. If you'd like to raise your hand if you're joining virtually or come to the podium if you're in person. Christy Evans. All right, I do not see Christy. Our next speaker is Anita Ralston. Go ahead, Anita. All right, thank you. Good evening. My name's Anita Ralston and I am a general ed teacher at Garden Gate Elementary. This is my 21st year of teaching with 16 of those in Cupertino. I'm here tonight to speak about the concerns from myself and many other teachers regarding support for student behavior. First, I would like to thank you for providing reading and math intervention and ELD support. Uh, definitely noticed an increase in the academic side of those students learning. My greatest concern is the extreme behavior we are experiencing in the classroom. This is affecting the teacher being able to teach and the rest of the class being able to learn. There is growing severity in student behavior. It is increasing and there are no consequences to the student. Under no circumstances should a student be allowed to harm a teacher, let alone another person. Teachers and paras have been physically harmed, hit, kicked, scratched, and spat on. We have been threatened. For example, having scissors pointed at their neck being told, I'm going to cut you, or having a student repeatedly say, I am going to kill you. We have been verbally abused by being told to F off or you are a B word. Um, students have had massive tantrums in the room, such as screaming, running around, and purposely breaking items like the teacher's iPhone, iPad, um, and at times, the whole class has been forced to evacuate the classroom. The class is then supposed to wait it out until the student comes calms down and then we are to resume like nothing has happened. How are we as teachers supposed to teach and students learn when they are not in a safe and healthy environment? These are just a few examples of what are happening inside the classroom that no one is addressing. We are told to fill out an injury form or to document these incidents, then nothing is being done. This is a key reason teachers are leaving the classrooms. The mental and physical exhaustion is becoming too much and it's taking too much of a toll on teachers. Please do not let CUSD become another statistics. Please act now before it is too late. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Our next speaker is Steve Greenfield. Steve, if you could raise your hand or come to the podium. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, uh, board members and EC members and esteemed colleagues here tonight. My name is Steve Greenfield. I am a fifth grade teacher, uh, general ed teacher at Dilworth. I am also the CEA representative and someone that has been with the CUSD in the past as both a student, a parent, a volunteer, and a teacher currently, and will continue to be a participant in the future. I am speaking tonight because I see and hear the words being posted, but the actions of our district not matching up. I hear how we are, the teachers are more than assets. We're treated as professionals and regarded as family. And yet each day we are measured by testing data we gather, which does not seem to drive learning directly. Testing our students is becoming the dominant portion of each quarter, displacing fundamental learning of new material and helping instill in our students a love of learning. We are teaching simply to test and get the results that show our students are good at taking tests. Collaboration with colleagues, once valued and prized by our district, is now guided by useless PDs and uninformed specialists of programs where students face 
real challenges to learning. And CUSD is a top performing school district because we have teachers that understand the value of a well-rounded education, not just academically, but also helping the child emotionally and socially. If you care about us and our balance between emotional, physical, and social well-being, still believe we are the professionals you hired above all other candidates, then take some programs away. Stop trying to fit one more straw onto our camel-like backs. The idea is to utilize what we have to its fullest extent, not keep adding on new and divergent programs and supplements. Think about what makes CUSD the district people move into and build upon that. Don't break the system just because it's a new program. Remember, you hired your employees as professionals and valued staff, not simply as assets to be used up and then tossed aside like spent batteries. Let us see the holistic care we read about firsthand. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Steve. That was our final speaker. That concludes public comment for tonight. Thank you. Next. Um, on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Superintendent Yao. Thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep mine fairly short tonight. Um, I have been out for the last couple of days. Um, one is, is, although we recognize that there is a lot of work that we're continuing to do, one of the highlights I think was uh, this morning we were contacted by Mercury News um, just as a highlight for our district because we are one of the few districts that have begun to implement the Prop 28 and actually went out and hired the music teachers. Um, where very few districts have done that. So, you know, we are making those strides. Um, the reality is we have not received the money from Prop 28 yet. We, we hear that we may receive it in February, but we know that that was one of the things that was important for our students and based on staff feedback and parent feedback and board feedback is that we really did want to expand that music. And so we did take kind of that leap of faith and, and reached out and were able to hire and now have those eight additional music teachers. And our full intent is to continue to add music teachers so that our students can benefit at all grade levels. So that was one highlight. Erin um, was actually interviewed this morning and they um, highlighted a teacher at Stockholmeyer. So we'll get to read about that. The other one that I just wanted to, to take a moment and, and highlight is that um, we recently had 38 of our middle school students who have been accepted into the California All-State Honor Bands Orchestra and Choir. Um, it is a very tenuous, uh, difficult audition that they go through. Thousands of the kids apply across the state. And so we're very proud to have 38 of our students that were selected and they'll be performing in February in Sacramento. So um, we'll take a, an opportunity later on at another future board meeting to recognize those students as well. But just wanted to share those two highlights and um, congratulate our students for the work. Thank you. It's very exciting about our music students. And it's also very exciting that we have hired the new music teachers. That was one of the promises we made when we closed the two schools was that we would increase our music education and we're well on our way. So thank you so much for that. That's great. Okay, consent. I need a motion for the consent calendar. I move to approve item 6.1 through 6.9. Thank you, Jerry. Is there a second? I will second. Thank you, Ava. Um, I guess we need a roll call vote for this. Trustee Matato. Aye. Trustee Chow. Aye. Trustee Liu. Aye. Trustee Vogel. Aye. Okay, motion carries, thank you. Information, enrollment task force data update. Mm -hmm. However you say those words. <laughs> enrollment task force update. Superintendent. Thank you. So uh, we're happy tonight. We're being, we just had our second enrollment task force committee in November. And so Leslie Maines um, facilitates those meetings, invited her to give a brief update. Um, a lot of the portion of this meeting really was sharing back with them the, the work that they've done and our policies that have gone into place. We did a quick um, review of the survey that we didn't have a lot of time to do in September. And then we really started the work of where we headed to in the future for the work of the committee. So um, I'll turn it over to Leslie and she can share where we are. Welcome okay. Leslie, it's good to have you. It's nice to be back. It's super great to be back. I think this will be a pretty short presentation. Um, we got a lot accomplished at our last meeting, but a lot of it was also reflecting based on the meeting that I presented at um, a couple months ago. So um, we reminded the task force of the four recommendations that the board approved, one having to do with Stockelmeyer um, and open enrollment priority, the other talking about target size priority where we defined large schools as 486, um, shifting from a living wait list to an annual open enrollment wait list, and then um, the choices of one alternative and one attendance area school. 
what we shared with uh, the task force and they were ear to ear smiling um, that the board was in favor of their full, their four recommendations. We also shared with them that our comments to you were that some of the things that we were recommending initially were changed because of great input from the task force, which made them very proud. And I think they feel like they are owners of the process. <coughs> and we shared that when we left your, the meeting here, um, actually it should say, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was thinking it said five board members. All board members approved the four recommendations. Um, so one direction that we got from the group when you gave us feedback was, communicating changes in multiple ways. And I see those changes coming almost weekly from the communications team. They like still receive those emails. And so I know that they are working really hard at making sure um, the community understands what has changed and the new processes. Um, they, I don't believe they've started this yet, but to inform schools of which schools may potentially have space. But as we get closer to that open enrollment window and the opening of that, the staff will begin to look at numbers at school sites. They'll look at staffing and they'll be able to let families know if you are going to open enroll, these are the schools that would be open based on adequate number of space for additional students which does take into consideration some wiggle room for neighborhood students who have not yet enrolled. Um, and then this group also shared that we may wanna consider and think about CAPS. We don't want too many kids moving from a large school to another school so that we end up sort of creating this one year we have high and low. What we're really trying to do is equalize. And so that the staff will look at how do we create CAPS caps so that we do not move uh, significant numbers that would create an imbalance, continue to create imbalances. <clears throat> so these were the same actions that were completed that we shared with the team. You saw these at the last meeting. And so the dates have been set, communication has begun, um, parent information session, there must have been one two nights ago. And then there'll be another one on December 13th. And then the policy and regulation changes have been completed or the regulations may be still underway. So then we jumped into asking the task force to think again about the parent survey data that we provided them and reflect upon um, what we gathered from them um, at their first meeting. And we wanted them to give us some direction, some thoughts about what do we do now? Do we go out and do another survey? Do we look at things differently? And this is what they shared with us at the last meeting. Um, they didn't really believe that a new survey at this point in time was necessary. Um, they felt that we should look at creative ways to integrate the resources that we have, the creative creativity and talents of staff. Um, you know, what they shared was there are staff in our district across all union groups that do amazing, tremendous things. And so how can we um, bring them into the fold to be able to provide support and enrichment for students in ways that would make sense? Um, and so they said, you know, that's something to look for because we probably have a lot of untapped resources that we could benefit from or really that the students could benefit from. <clears throat> They did say it would probably not be a bad idea to start to compare what programs are currently in place. Um, what we talked about is we don't really believe that every school needs to look exactly the same, but wouldn't it be great to know what is happening at each of the schools in regards to um, activities and programming for, stick, for kids? How is it funded? How is it supported? Um, who are those wonderful vendors or those leasees that are at campuses that is working well? And then begin to compare that as an, as an option. Um, they said it would be interesting to explore what the barriers to programming after school is and how do we shift up or ramp, ramp up opportunities for all kids. And so they were looking at that with an equity lens. Um, they wanted us to explore ways that the district could profit from having programming on our school site. And so primarily that would be through leases, et cetera, or through parent paid activities. Part of it is um, these parents see that families go to school and then they're, if both parents are working, they pull their kids out of school and they take them somewhere else for enrichment. So is there a way that we can use those programs on our campus 
Um, so it makes it easier for families. And then um, if we, going back up to some of the barriers, um, if we were to uncover some inequities at school sites, um, are there ways that we can look at outside agencies such as CEF or others to be able to support the gap that we may find? Then we skipped into um, talking about our enrollment again. Um, we shared our CBEDS data. Um, the 2023 data is the preliminary CBEDS number. We talked pretty extensively about why our numbers in elementary have grown, and it's because we've added transitional kindergarten. And so that's helped us maintain and increase our enrollment in the primary grades. Um, we did this for the purpose of really beginning to look at our next focus area, which would be middle schools and whether or not the group had a desire to begin a discussion about balancing enrollment at middle schools and are there some creative things that we should consider. And so we um, shared with them our middle school enrollment. What you'll see in the 2023 line, so that's this year, the number not in parentheses is the preliminary CBEDS number. The number in parentheses was the number that we got from Decision Insight at the last board meeting, so about a year ago. So what you'll note is their projections were pretty close. Um, and so, you know, when, when we're looking at their projection, projections, we look at moderate for certain purposes and conservative for other purposes, but they're not really right at this point, they're not leading us astray. We don't believe they are. And then as we look at the future years, I believe that Decision Insight is coming to present. We are, so we're on schedule hopefully uh, for next week. Okay, so the numbers that you have here will change based on their new information that they have shared with us. And so we looked at the enrollment numbers, had a discussion. I think some individuals of our task force still are not really um, firmly grounded in the belief that the demographer is um, uh, making uh, accurate uh, um, ac accurate projections, which um, I think we as a group believe that it is serving the purpose the way we need it to serve. And we're getting the information that we need to be able to staff classrooms and make sure we have the right number in classes and also be fiscally responsible in um, how we're doing that. So then what we did is we had Sarah Brown present to us what she presented to you, a very, very abbreviated version of the middle school elective program. And so I think it was great for this group of individuals to be part of, to learn about. A couple of them are middle school people, um, parents, but the majority of them, I think this was really exciting for them um, to look at what we had, what we were offering. And then we brought them back to our original work that happened the first meeting um, when this task force was, our first set of meetings when this task force was organized. Um, the areas of focus were open enrollment policies and processes. And at this point in time, we've checked that one off. Flexible boundaries and balancing enrollment at middle schools sort of came together. The flexible boundaries that they created, as I shared at the last meeting, is really just giving some priority through open enrollment, which really is a very large flexible boundary rather than just a neighboring flexible boundary. And then we highlighted balancing enrollment at middle schools and asked them if they wanted to move forward with that conversation, what was the information they would need in order to be able to dig into that topic and potentially come up with some creative options like they did for our elementary school. And so they would like the new demog demographer report um, with the latest updates. Um, they are requesting at the next meeting that we have facility yeah. maps um, also with the capacity of the schools, as well as um, elective expansion. So they're curious about as electives become an as two electives become an opportunity for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, what are the things that we can do on those campuses? And what are the things that we maybe can't do? Because each facility is a little bit different. And so does every school have the ability to have a metal shop? 
does every school have the ability to have two cooking two cooking rooms? And so those kinds of things that they would like us to explore and talk about. They'd like to look at the numbers at each grade level because we've given them whole numbers. Um, they wanted some data from student assignment on open enrollment numbers and the acceptance rate and the current living wait list, knowing that that's going to go away, but just to see where is where's the demand. And um, Kristen would be able to break that up into year by year. So we'd be able to see who on that list requested a shift this last year during open enrollment or who on those lists have been sitting there for anywhere from one to two years potentially three years. If they had lotteried to get in in their fifth grade year for sixth grade, they potentially could still be sitting on that wait list and never having an opportunity to move. They also wanted information on our SDC and low SES numbers at middle school to see, is there a balance um, at the school sites or is there some correlation to the number on the campus compared to the number of students with special needs? One of the things that we shared with them is that our spe students with special needs, most of them all attend their, their home middle school unless they have lottery to go somewhere else and that has been approved. And then um, they were wondering, their, their question was survey data, not going back to our, other, our original survey that we looked at on the earlier slide, but what do our middle school um, staff members community members and students say about their new experiences with um, multiple uh, multiple electives. We don't have that survey data, but they said it would be interesting to look at that. That would be in, it would be something that they would would like to chew on. So, so with that, um, we took a break. That was our two hours with them, and we have three more meetings for the school year. And so our next meeting, we will take back um, most of the data that they're requesting. Um, we'll go through that January 23rd, and then um, I'll come back and present at that time. So if you have any questions or comments. I would um, just add to, you. you know, it's all kind of tying nicely together because um, we do have, we are in the process where we have our new projected in student enrollment numbers that we'll be able to bring to the board hopefully next week. We'll also then share it with the committee. Um, we're also next week's study session is on career tech ed um, information and where does that fit into the middle schools. And so I think there's all these pieces that are coming together. And, you know, just that reminder that when we did the work of the school consolidations, one of the pieces that we had looked at was middle schools and said, you know, we would continue to monitor the middle schools and, you know, by 2025 have a sense of where they are. And, you know, I think it's really helpful with our new projected numbers to take a look at that. You know, are we stabilizing? But I think as we stabilize, then some of those areas where there are lower enrollment really becomes evident and the work of the committee ties perfect timing into, you know, meeting the needs of the students. So I think everything's fitting together very nicely. Timing is Great. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay. Jerry, do you, do you have something? Eva? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I really okay. like the last part when you were talking and explaining the survey results. And before I even ask the question, uh, I really appreciate the enrollment task force and mm -hmm. let's say you leading it because within the past year, there has been a lot of progress coming out in, from the enrollment. And I think they were meeting like four times. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of work coming from the community and doing that. So I appreciate that. Um, the survey that they were asking about, um, and let me see if I got this right. They attended for the the students and staff on how they feel about the electives, and I'm mm -hmm. assuming the community as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I, that's what I recall yeah. from the conversation mm -hmm. is, would we consider doing a survey to find out how middle school teachers, students, and parents feel about the expansion of the elective program? That's a really good ask to see how that is going. And I wonder what that would also look like. And I believe uh, CMS has been doing two like this for a while, right? Correct. So I wonder how would those questions be different since been, they've been doing it? And as a board member, I think that would be great to see. And I wonder if my colleagues feel the same. 
And, and I think part of the impetus when they asked the question is um, when we when Sarah was presenting about the shift in the middle schools and expanding to the two electives, initially the work had been done of doing the survey with students and parents. And so, you know, after a year, year and a half of implementation, what, what are the needs now of the students? You know, how are the two electives working? What are some of those new, new areas? And so I do think that fits in with the work of what Ed Services is going to do with that continued expansion of two electives. And uh, the other point, I wonder if other people want to comment before my second point, or however you want to do it. Why don't you finish and then they can comment if they choose okay. when it's their turn. All right. Thanks, so. Phyllis. Um, so the other point on there was facility maps and capacity as well as the elective expansion space. Mm -hmm. I think that might come in handy and we're talking about uh, timing. Um, we at our last board meeting, we did ask uh, a company to look into surveying to see what our community would think about a bond. And one of the things that the bond could do is looking at the electives in terms of, um, for instance, cooking. If cooking is needed in this space, there's a lot of equipment that goes with cooking that people may not consider uh, stoves, uh, washing machines, like what's that for? Well. There's a lot of linen and things that you would clean and you would reuse and you would have to wash those linens um, and towels and such. So um, just examples, ovens, stovetops, you know, there's equipment that uh, that comes into classroom that people don't think of besides the consumables such as the food itself. So um, I like where this is going. So thank you. Thank you, Eva. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I can Here go next. Go yeah. So first of all, thanks. Good to see you again, Leslie, yeah. and for sharing the work. And you know, please pass on our thanks to the committee here. Uh, I have a lot of jumbled thoughts in my head mm -hmm. right now, so I'll, I'll try to maybe un unpack that. Uh, one question I had is, it looks like the last meeting is April, in April 24. Um, do you all have sort of a sense of what the work plan schedule might look like? Do you see bringing back any sort of Mm -hmm. um recommendations by that time or do you think it might potentially go into the fall or is it too early to say um, it may be too early to say um i think out in our january meeting when we start presenting the data to them and they they um look into it i i have confidence that they will bring something back by april though there will be some kind of confidence okay all right a recommendation that they're they are an amazing group but you know it's a small group but when they dig into it they're very creative and, you know, they have different perspectives that work really well together. So I would foresee us bringing some kind of recommendation. Okay. All right. No, that, that, that would be great. And then I, I guess the other thing is, this, and I would second what um, Ava mentioned about, you know, really considering the possibilities of what a bond could bring if we, you know, if we had that, um, how that could, um, you know, um, just something to consider. Right, so it looks like from what you're sharing here is they're considering so, um, certainly the enrollment uh, balance, but then electives being a part of that. Uh, it looks like that's a thread that's interweaved in here, which which I think is great. I, I think that's certainly a big part of it. Um, a, a question, although I'm not really expecting an answer from you, but maybe something for the committee to think about, is we have far fewer middle schools than we do elementary schools. Right? Elementary schools are a little closer and there's probably a little bit more um, there's just a lot more of them. And so the um, the distance from one to the next is not as far as we have only five middle schools. They tend to be scattered pretty far. And so then I do wonder, it's great they're thinking about the input into sort of this, you know, I imagine some sort of a, a model, an engine, but then what are the possible levers when the schools are so far apart? Um, I, I find myself wondering what are what are the levers we have available to influence folks, um, and so I'd be I'm sure they'll get to that eventually. Uh, but it's just something that's sort of think I'm sort of bouncing around my head right now. I'm very interested in tapping into the creativity into thinking about that. But overall, this is going in a great direction. So very happy to see this and look forward to the uh, next update. Great, thanks. Thank thanks, thanks, Jerry Satish. Did you have anything? Yeah, I, I think um, I think you both covered and. Uh, so thank you. A lot of good work actually done and good progress, you can see. On, um, I think a general question on this demographics report, right? So um, the latest report, what frequency at which we can get that? And uh, because since you're looking into, I know that month to month or six months to six months, it can change. And what is that? Like some insight on that? 
as far as updates from the committee? Yeah, updates. So, because now we have put, we got, I think that's one of the things anyway, right? Like one of the asks actually. And plus uh, the previous data, um, how accurate it is, like kind of definitely when you're going from year after year, you know, the variation is quite high also. So right. what frequency, first question is what frequency at which we can get that. And generally the in the past trend about the accuracy of it. They they give it to us annually. Annually. And part yeah, so we typically will get it in January, which gives us the newest and closest projections as we plan for the following school year, as Chris plans for bed for budget purposes. Then what they need to do is they need to see, okay, so then what really happened? And they don't really know what really happened until fall has happened, seabeds has happened. And so they continually work with Mahmood on data. And so if we notice something that has shifted or if there's an area that shifts. Um, in regards to, I don't know, if if a grid code shifts in one way or another that would affect um, a population of students at a certain school, they'll do minor tweaks along the way. Um, but typically it is an annual cycle because of the work that goes into the projection and then the wait and see to see the fruition of the student enrollment that we get each year. <clears throat> yeah, now, now we are going to change this next year, how the open enrollment, enrollment and the balancing, at least in the elementary, we have, we have a new proposal, right? So mm -hmm. the same, so what happens is the shift will happen, right? We, you, we expect some shift to happen mm -hmm. from bigger school to the smaller schools and there'll be a move. So uh, definitely demographers and us, there could be a difference then, like in terms mm -hmm. of, let's just talk about mayor, they are projecting so much. We should not be having it based on this. It should, it should be lower, right? So how do, how do, that, how do you keep this loop um, completed? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important part where we communicate with Decision Insight whenever we're doing any of these changes to enrollment. You know, I think with our new policies, we're not going to see this massive, nor do we want this massive shift, uh, for example, out of Stockholm. Or that, that wasn't the intent. You know, it really was to spread out. I think the important part when we bring back the numbers for you guys to get a chance to look at where our projected enrollments are is we do see that stabilization of the district, which, you know, I think the work that we've done over these last couple of years, that's what really is a benefit. I would, I would like to say, you know, some of the things that we're bringing into the district is keeping our families here, even though there are many reasons they're moving out of the district. But we do see our enrollment start to stabilize. And to me, that's the exciting part, because now it truly is you know, before we were trying to balance enrollment, but also declining enrollment everywhere, where at least if we have our enrollment stabilized, we really can do that work. So, you know, if we had saw anything unusual, some new housing came in that we hadn't planned for, we can always ask them to go in and look for, for a new report. But for basically, we get that information each year. And so we don't, we don't really see a need to have the information updated more than the annual time because it, it, it gets to us in time that we can use it for our, our long term because we don't necessarily use the demographers projections for planning for next year as much because we already know where our numbers are coming in from it's more that long-term planning that we use those numbers for that's good anyway i think it's pretty interesting mm -hmm. going to be the, the january you know our plans right like mm -hmm. a, how the overall mm -hmm. enrollment and how it is going to go and that'll be good if we get an update on how the distribution is going. Right. Right. Thank you. I appreciate the value. Absolutely. Thank you. I just have one question. Um, when the committee comes back with these recommendations, <clears throat> presumably at least some in April, are you anticipating implementing like in the fall or is this more long term or is it some of each? We don't know until we know what the recommendations are. There, there could go. be some okay. that are short-term that yeah. we could be if they're, you know, more the, the ones that are policy changes and we would foresee them at the following year to give time for implementation. It's okay. the unknown. Okay. A work in progress. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. You're welcome. Thank you. Always nice to see you. Next, we have a discussion. I. We did not have any public comments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, next, we had a discussion item, uh, first interim budget report. I assume that's you, Chris. Are you going to open this, Stacey? I, I just want to say, you know, this is our first look at um, our first interim. And so it is based on the information that we have. I know that we we're all at CSBA last week and had some of the updates on what the fiscal outlook looks for the state. Um, and so Chris and Tina and their team really look at everything available that they have to create this multi-year. Um, and so this will be our chance. To, this is a draft tonight for feedback. And then we would bring it back next week for approval. So I'll turn it over to Chris and Tina. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. And, um... This will be a, a joint effort tonight, um, but I'll start us off by just saying all the thank yous as well. 
um, staff team especially uh, put, spend a lot of time to put together this document that's in front of you. This is our our our, our annual uh, semi annual uh, report. Um, as you know, the first annual report is a series of multiple reports during the year that we bring to you. So this is our first snapshot of uh, the fiscal status of the year. And as Stacy mentioned, after tonight's presentation, we will bring this back for your action um, at our next meeting, which we'll, we'll be asking you to approve, which will be a positive certified person in the report. So I won't get into the, those details yet, but I just wanna say thank you to Tina and the staff for that. Um, so as I mentioned, we're, we're kind of going through this calendar part of the process right now. We recently brought to you the adopted budget last June. We brought to you an update as of the state enacted budget. And we brought to you the 45 day budget update in August. We brought to you in September, the final results from the 22, 23 school year. And now with all that information rolling forward, tonight is our first opportunity to share with you what are some of the changes since we did adopt our budget last June, as far as changes with revenue, changes with expenditures, and probably most importantly, how that affects the bottom line. And when I refer to the bottom line as that multi-year projection. So we'll end on that. But um, I'll just kind of go through this a couple of slides and I'll have to kind of go through a summary of the changes. But for the most part, we're just going through this cycle here. And then obviously when you hear me talk about the budget, it's not always talking about a one-year budget. Everything is really in the context of multiple years. And, and I appreciate the board for your wherewithal to look at our budget over a span of five years. And so when we look at a five-year budget, it's literally looking at five years worth of budget assumptions as well. And so as we move through this cycle, each time I come to you, there's a, poss there's a chance, there's a possibility that some of those assumptions will change. And as you'll get the sense, we'll start talking more about budget assumptions, especially in January when the governor comes out with his proposed budget for 20, uh, 23, 24. Um, and we'll start talking a little bit more about those assumptions and things like that. But really just to kind of talk about the, the cycle as well. We'll go through this, update you on what we know today. What I tell you today is gonna change in, 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 in a couple of months. And then we'll come back to you to bring back to you the second annual report. And that's usually brought back to the board around that first part of March. And so we'll, we'll be talking about it throughout the year. Um, so I'll let uh, Tina kind of go through some of the changes, both revenue and expenditures. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight about the first interim. So um, what we are showing on this slide, as Chris mentioned, is back in August, we presented to you the 45-day budget update, and those were things that had changed since the time we adopted the budget. And um, a couple of those things, of course, changed again. And Chris, as Chris mentioned, they'll continue probably to change. So the first one, the art, music, and instructional materials block grant, originally when we put together the budget, they um, were predicting about a 50% decrease in that particular block grant, and it only ended up coming out at a 6% decrease. So um, that was a $4 million savings to us to be able to continue to infuse into what you heard is an amazing art and music uh, programs for our students. And so um, that was a, a big change, and that's the reason why you see revenue increases there. Another one, uh, Prop 28. So that was brand new funding um, from the voters. And that was not budgeted at all because we still didn't have all the details from the state yet when we put together the adopted budget. So that's an increase of 1.6 million. And so that's why we have uh, an increase in our uh, art and music for Prop 28. We also received additional monies for universal pre-K implementation in 22-23 that were not expected. And so there was a $700,000 increase um, there as well. There's also other various categorical programs. We've highlighted the big ones, and then we are seeing an increase in local donations right now. So right now we're about 15% over our adopted budget for local donations. And so that's great. I think this is one of the areas where we're seeing continued um, uh, impacts from coming back from the pandemic. I think we see a lot more um, people getting more involved in their children's education and making donations. So we're seeing that uh, increase as well. 
And then the kitchen infrastructure um, monies that we received were one-time monies. So that those are decreasing now because they're going away. We just received them one time. That was $25,000. We could go to the next. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Chris. So some of the expenditure changes. So um, if you remember in um, our adopted budget, we had a... Um, collective bargaining agreement for the 8% raises um, for our certificated, classified, and uh, management staff. So that 8% increase was not included directly in the adopted budget. However, we identified it down in the carryover money of how that money was gonna be carried over and then worked back into the budget. So now that we're in first interim in 23-24, we have worked all those expenditures into the budget. So therefore you see an increase. That's why you see increases in all the salaries and benefits. You now see increases for those um, additional uh, salaries. So that alone was almost with the, the salaries and benefits was about $17 million. So um, that's a tremendous increase. I think the other thing that we're seeing is at this time last year, we had 126 vacancies. And as of um, today, we only have 75 vacancies. So that's 51 more employees that we have in the district, which is fabulous, fills critical positions to support kids. And, um, but that is diff a difference that we had from um, this time last year. Some of the other changes down here at the bottom, um, supplies and materials. I apologize, that font is really, really small. Supplies and materials. So as I mentioned with the revenues increasing in some of those block grants, art and music, et cetera, that means the materials will also increase just with the revenue coming in, the expenditures go up as well. So you'll see increases in the supplies and materials. We also had some increases in technology devices for our students. Um, the middle one is services and operating. So we had some increases on um, our proper property and liability insurance, um, some legal support for negotiations, utility costs, and some carryover funds. So our services have gone up a little bit. And the last one, capital outlay. You'll also remember um, at the end of um, when we were doing the budget for 23-24, we had set aside some money for the safety and security fencing project. So 1.5 million has been built into this first interim report. And that's why you see the capital outlay increase there as well. So the last thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is um, due to those salary raises and negotiations that we um, are increasing salaries as well as our health and welfare benefits, what that means then is there's increased contributions that we'll be making in order to continue to support SPED. So for example, in special education, if the salaries are going up, then that means our contribution to support special education will continue to go up. So just to kind of give you a ballpark, um, in 22-23, our contribution to the special education program was about $22 million. And in 23-24, currently right now, based on first interim, it's about $29 million. So that's, that's going up a significant amount. And that primarily has to do with the increases in our salaries and our health and welfare increases. Also, similar to that, RRMA, what is that? Routine Restricted Maintenance Account. So that's our Routine Restricted Maintenance. And we um, also make contributions to support that. So that's all of our custodial staff and uh, maintenance staff that support our schools. And so it's exact same thing with all those salaries that we have within that. Once those go up with the 8% increase, then that means that our um, contribution then to cover that will then also go up. At this time, I will turn it back over to Chris. Uh, thank you. No, thank you, Tina. Um, this slide may look familiar. I shared with the board back when we closed the books how we ended last year. And as when we ended last year, we had uh, at the time estimated the ending fund balance to be about 19, almost $20 million less than what we actually closed the book. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention this again, is that when we adopted the budget, there were some things that were not in the budget. Now that Tina mentioned to you about all these things that were now added back to the budget, most of this money that was uh, assigned as of the time we closed the books now have been obligated to current things in the budget. And mainly that the largest amount is the 8% salary raise, uh, raise that we've given. So 
with the exception of, I think, the instructional materials monies, everything else here has been reallocated toward existing expenditures directly in the budget. Um, and so maybe just kind of just now just talk a little bit about the multi-year projection. So just to orient everybody, we are looking at five years of projections. We have the current year and the second column that represents the 23-24 school year, and then each subsequent year afterwards. The top line represents what the beginning balance is at the beginning of that fiscal year. And then about three quarters of the way down, there's a, a line that says ending fund balance. So you have a beginning fund balance and an ending fund balance. And in between the beginning fund balance and the ending fund balance, you have what we're estimating or projecting to receive in terms of new revenues. And that's listed on the, the total revenue line. And then those total expenditures, that's representative on that next line there. So when you take the beginning balance, add the total revenues, subtract the total expenditures, then you get the remaining balance, the ending fund balance. And then out of that ending fund balance, there's a couple of things I want to highlight that, that, that you already know what's part of that. As part of that ending fund balance is there's some components. Within those components, the most important ones are our legal required reserve requirements. So for our district of our size, our minimum reserve level is 3%. Our board has by board policy adopted uh, a, a, a policy to have a reserve higher than the minimum EDCO 3%. And so right now, um, although it's not 10%, I know we've talked about bringing our reserve up to 10%. With everything added back into the budget, including the raises, if the, if the year was to end today, this is what we would be looking at the end of the, the, the year with about a 6.94% reserve. In excess of our 3%, but not quite yet 10. Uh, I apologize that we're not able to do that. But for the purposes of this multi-year, we can demonstrate over this period of time where we can maintain our minimum reserve levels. But you'll see over time, we will be able to bring our reserve level back up to as much as 10. But it's going to take a little bit of time based off of these current assumptions here. So um, also to just want to highlight, so uh, there's a there's a box here that says revenue less expenditures. So in the current year, 23-24, based off of what we're projecting to receive and based off of what we're projecting to spend, we're, we're projecting to deficit spend by about 30, almost $39 million <coughs> this year. That's the combined general fund, restricted and unrestricted. And then the following year in the north of the year, we're still projected to decline, but not as much, and only about $11 million. But then in the out years, our revenues are now maintaining the pace of our expenditure. So the deficit spending uh, under this example here is kind of going away by that third year. So that, that's something to just be aware of. But probably the, the one thing to walk away from is that, you know, we'll, we'll be able to meet our reserve requirements. And um, this is based off of right now, what we know, this, doesn't factor any specific changes with compensation other than what's been negotiated so far, but we definitely want to make sure that we set aside monies for salaries and, and, and changes with benefits. So right now, um, we're trying to accommodate places for that in the ending fund balance as well. If I could just add to one of the areas that that was a little challenge is our employee benefits because January is our first month to put in where we uh, fully cover 100% employee benefits. So we just completed open enrollment. We know that, and hopefully that many of our employees go off the waiver and enroll in our uh, benefit program, but we have no idea how many will. So we really were trying to estimate it. You know, I would assume every year that more and more employees would take advantage of that, but we don't know that number at this point. But we will we will be able to capture that when we come back with second enrollment. By the time open enrollment is closed, we'll have the system be able to calculate really what the impact is of all those that came back from waivers or those that are taking full advantage of the fully paid employee only benefits. All right. Anyway, I'll 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 move off of the multi year. If I'll come back and entertain any questions that the board has, but I think everyone's kind of familiar with the, the form. Um, and just to kind of kind of summarize a lot of it, 
So this is kind of right now what we're project, how we're projecting to spend all of our dollars in those various categories as I shared with the board. Um, I didn't map out how this comes, maps out to our district priorities, but this is just mainly how the state wants us to account for um, our total budget. And so as you can see the four quadrants here, the bottom right hand quadrant is the largest portion of our budget is spent on instruction and special education instruction. Um, and then to the left um, is the portion of the budget spent on instructional related services. The top left hand corner is how much is spent on general administration. And the top right hand corner is what's spent on maintenance and operations. Um, so that's kind of gives you a, a picture of the pie with all the various colored slices. Um, I'll have uh, Tina introduce the next couple slides. This is some information I think the board requested. So we're, we're experimenting with a, a new software program that can pull out some of the data. So Tina? Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Chris. So as Chris mentioned, we are experimenting with a new program. It's called Comparative Analytics, and they collect data from all over the entire state of California from school districts, and then they compile that data for us. So we have new access to data that we haven't had access to before. But you will have to forgive me. We're still working on the chart. So up here, it's not going to look very clean in your book. I'm going to be referring to pages 27, 28, and 29. So if you want to um, change, change to those in your book, uh, the first one we talked about is on page 27. So in our multi-year um, projection, as Chris mentioned, it does include us moving into basic aid in uh, next year, 24, 25, and remaining in basic aid. That means that the majority of the money that we will receive for our funding, our education for our students will come from property taxes. So for the purposes of this next slide, what we did was a revenue comparison to other basic aid districts in Santa Clara County. So um, on your in your packet, there will be um, a list of who's in our focus district. Um, so you can reference that. It includes other basic aid districts that are primarily all elementary and middle school as well. So as you can see from this chart, Cupertino Union is at the bottom of the chart with Lakeside being at the top. And this is based on revenue from the year 2022. So remember, these are districts that are already in basic aid. We are just getting ready to move into it. So they already have higher property tax uh, revenues that they're receiving. But just to give you a ballpark, the average amongst all of these basic aid districts is about 23,000. We're sitting down at about 15,000. And then Lakeside at the top is at 44,000. So it just gives you um, an idea of where we're at it from a revenue perspective in comparison to other basic aid districts. So now let's talk a little bit about expenditures. So we'll move to the next slide. So this first one, and this is uh, directly related to a request that you had, Trustee Lou, about um, per student spending. So this one is related to total expenditures and the average per student. So on this graph, um, you can see the colors. So I'll reference the colors. So the top line is red. That's the peer group. That's our Santa Clara County basic aid peer group. The darker blue, which is the second line, that's our county average. The yellow line below that is the state average. And the teal greenish bluish color, that's um, us, the focus district as Cupertino. So this shows you um, across many years, how the uh, total expenditures for per student spending has been in each of these districts. And again, I'll point out, we are just getting ready to move into basic aid. So as you saw, we have less revenue. That means we have less expenditures. However, um, it does give you a picture of what it looks like across the state, the county, and then among our peer group. So our peer group, again, being the red and then we're yeah. the teal green. So just to give you a ballpark, total expenditure per student, 14,000 approximately for Cupertino and 19,000 per student for the, the peer group. So then we'll talk about, um, Stacy and I were having a conversation and she said, you know what would be interesting is if we could see a comparison of personnel expenditures. So just the cost of salaries and wages across those basic aid districts. So I played with it and I was able to get the data. So on page 25 in your book, we have the per student spending this is solely just personnel expenditures. So what's interesting is the bottom line overlaps our, the focus district, which is us, and the state average. So that's at about 12,000 per student. 
And then the top red line is our peer group again, and they're up at about 16,000. So um, I think the goal of this was just to be able to share with you the comparison of other basic aid districts as we start to make that transition and start to look at those comparisons. So you have that data. And at this point, I'll turn it back to Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. So good information. Obviously, we're just kind of playing around with it, but there's it's it's almost endless as far as what we can take a look at all these little pieces of data around the, the fiscal, fiscal picture. So I, I thought I'd just kind of wrap things up on, okay, so what's next? Um, we've heard a lot tonight, Tina you know, talked about moving into basic A, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But mainly right now, we're kind of still in that wait and see pattern. Uh, we, we've been hearing, there's a lot of information out now as far as how the state is tracking right now with its projected revenues for this year, and especially now with the tax revenues starting to come in. I think the, the, the state is projecting a state deficit to some degree. Um, we are hearing that what was once the projected COLA for next year back in May for next year was estimated to be 3.93 is now estimated to be somewhere in the the ones, or I hate to say sub ones, but at least one, I'm hoping. But benefit, I guess the benefit to us is that if we do move, if we do eventually move into basic aid, as, I, as you heard me say, COLA becomes less relevant for the bulk of our funding because property taxes and the property tax growth will be the driving factor. Now, I just want to say one thing, one caveat is that we have already presumed the best case scenario in our multi-year as far as property tax growth. Unless the property tax growth comes in more than what we've estimated, what I'm showing you or what we're showing you now is kind of our best case scenario as far as total revenues. So even if the COLA drops, we're already presuming the, the, the property tax growth and so that's there. So I just want to make sure I'm very clear is that we're going to hear that the revenues are going to be changing significantly for school districts. But if we do move into basic aid, which I'm, which we're still projecting, we're not going to, we're going to be, uh, I guess, protected in a way because our, our revenue is not going to be mainly driven by the, the lack of a COLA. But we've already built in an assumption that our property taxes will be growing at a at a particular mm -hmm. rate. So, so in a way, I think as we hear the changes with the cola, I don't think it really changes our projection for next year. However, it may change our projections in the out year because even though we've only heard that next year's cola is projected to be in that one the, the one percent range. We haven't gotten any definitive answer as far as what the projected COLA is for the second, the third, and the fourth year. We won't get that until January, but for purposes of our MYP, the county offices advise us to be conservative as far as our projection. So in our multi-year, we're actually projecting in the second year, 23, 20, uh, 20, 24, 25, a one and a half percent increase. And then the third year, 25, 26, another one and a half percent increase. So those numbers can change. We'll update those numbers once we get the information back from the governor when he releases his January budget. But so all that information will come back to us and we'll take another crack at it when we bring to you second interim. Um, so just again, continue to monitor things. The economic news is pretty volatile right now. Um, we'll come back with second interim. We'll bring that to you in March, as I mentioned. Um, and then as Stacy mentioned, we still need to assess the full impact of the changes with the health benefit care. So that's one more thing too, as well, that we'll be able to update with second interim. Um, so with that, I'll we'll entertain any questions or comments from the board. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Tina. Any questions, comments from the board? Anybody want to start? You have any questions, Satish? Oh, like, um, like, one is like, 
as you said, like uh, some of the things could change again. So already we are kind of like a about 39 million difference, right? In the deficit, I don't want to say deficit, but basically in the, in the negative side of it, right? From that. So how bad it can go further in the with the anticipated changes in the second interim kind of. Or have you planned a little bit on that already, some buffer? Well, I, I would say that right now we have we have we have accounted for everything that we know. Okay. Especially for the current year. It's the out year is more the unknown. And so really in this case, we're really only talking about things in the context of a one year budget, even though I've said that we look at everything over multi year, but for the for the okay. one year, definitely based off of what we know today, everything is pretty sad. I mean, it's not that we're hearing that the state is going back to make major cuts. We've not heard that. That has happened a couple of times in the distant past. But we're not, I don't believe we're in a situation right now where the state is saying, well, we're going to take back this year what we've, what we've told you that you're going to receive. But really, the, the question will be is, what will next year's budget looks like? Because if things get tight, obviously the COLA is the first thing to go. And God forbid anything gets worse. The, the, the state has, not say tricks, but the state does things to the budget to help manage, manage that. You've heard the word deferrals and things like that. That that's an, that's another another strategic tool that that the state can can do to help bridge some of these budget gaps. And then obviously there's the rainy day fund. So personally speaking, I'm hopeful that the governor and the legislature will find a way to make sure that districts get fully funded for Prop 98, which which we we need. But at the same time, all the other things like the stirs, purse, the, the pension costs, all those things continue to grow. So there's a lot of things in the budget that grow all by itself. And if there is not enough COLA to cover those things, it, it's, it's, it makes it challenging for districts. And so really, I think, I think the, 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 the story at the end of the day is that I think we're prepared. We're, we're, we're prepared to weather this. We have a reserve. But really, we won't know until the governor comes out in January as far as what he's projecting further down, further down the road. I, I would say the other thing in the multi-year, you know, to protect the priorities is we've made the commitment of lowering class sizes, um, expanding the electives. And so typically when we build out our multi-year, we look at a declining enrollment and we naturally look at attrition of teachers and we reduce the number of certificated um, some years pretty significant when we base on enrollment. And you'll see there's more of a stabilization, actually a slight increase because um, we, we probably will not lose as many teachers. Um, we will need to retain those teachers to hold our commitment. And so that's all been built into the, the multi-year as well so that we're, we ensure that all of our commitments are taken care of with this budget. And you mentioned that we are already in basic aid or we are into basic, or what is that? Like what are we? Projected to be in it in 24, 25 for next school. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, oh, thank you, Alvi. Eva, your questions, comments? Yes, I do. Um, Chris, uh, okay, so let me find my questions. I have it in two places. Um, <clears throat> so I thank you. Um, this, uh, in term report, I noticed that at the top of each of the category codes that you'll put one little words to help us remind me, remind me uh, what these categories mean. And I noticed that there was some coordination of where we are highlighted to where it is. So appreciate the uh, organization of this. Um, so one of the things that was new was the ask of uh, the data from Jerry of what would it look like comparing us with other basic aid districts. And I wonder where we are now comparing with other local control funding districts where we stand, because then that we will have a good comparison how where we are at with other LCFF districts 
currently because we're an LCFF. And then using what you put together with uh, <clears throat> the ask of um, basic aid, I think that was uh, what my question was because in... I should clarify too, Jerry's request was to look at average per student spending. Yeah. We, Chris and I, made the decision to okay. compare it to basic aid districts. So I don't want to put that on him. So oh, we, okay. made, we made that decision, but he wanted to really see the average per student spending, but we can absolutely get that information for you. Yeah. No problem we at have, all. We have it. We can put yeah. it in the slide. In the absolutely. Slide I just want to be clear. <laughs> no, the, the, the spending is a great idea, yeah, 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 yeah. but I, uh, and specifically comparing to basic aid. So um, if we can also do the same thing. Here you have a page on page 19 of the report, the assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, you have a projected of like from PK add-on per ADA and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. If you could have that for if we were LCFF as well. I think that was what my ask and email maybe wasn't um, explicit like Right, non-basic aid would look like, and then basic aid, but also what would it look like if it was continuing LCFF projection? Does that perfect. make sense? Sure. So on the assumptions, as I'm hearing you, as we transition or teeter, you want you would like the, maybe the assumptions, you like a set of assumptions that pertain if we stayed in basic mm -hmm. aid yeah. or stayed in LCFF, yeah. what? what would those assumptions look like or what would those? Yeah, what would those assumptions look if like? If everything given the same, our enrollment stayed the same yeah. what, and or, COLA was a 1%, what would be our revenue based if we were? How are you that? projecting with your assumptions what you're doing for basic aid, assuming the same thing, if we stayed in LCFF, how would that funding change in terms of helping to I, make I, I see what you, I see what you're yeah. trying to say. I see what you're saying, I think. Can I, can I maybe try to clarify maybe the question then? We know that by moving into basic aid, mm -hmm. the amount of money that we receive per pupil exceeds what we receive from the state via the COLA. So if we're an LCFF district, we are receiving the most amount of money based off of the number of students that we have. And on as, as we've projected, we're projecting to decline of enrollment. So we are showing that our our our, our per pupil funding is decreasing because we have fewer students. And we've now projected out the growth of property taxes. So the property taxes Maybe this is I don't have a maybe I don't have a good graph, but there's a graph we can create where we can show where the two basically the two lines cross one another. So basically we might be able to show illustrate for you the, the growth pattern for LCFF funding. When you look at how much we are receiving, whatever that per people amount is, and then when we when it crosses over where the property taxes then start to exceed that that's that's the point of when we're moving into basic A. So we are projecting, again, the scenario where we're receiving the most money, whether it is LCFF or, or basic aid. So our, our LCFF projector, what's in our multi years, is already making that projection that we're going to be benefiting more from property taxes starting next year. But, but, but if, if for your question, you just like to see more of a, more, some type of an illustration to show from a scenario standpoint how how much how much how much less money would we have gotten if it, we stayed LCFF right. versus how much money are how much money are we getting because of moving into basic yeah, I think we can do something. So I can I can try try to put something together for you. I, I appreciate that. And more general big picture question is when district or if we are switching from one type of funding to another is the transitional time like over summer or is it drastic in terms of how we're switching the funding or is it like couple forms? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's literally when we move from one fiscal year into the next. Okay. So um, 
there's a few there's a few moving moving parts here obviously we kind of have to wait for the county tax assessor's office to certify property taxes and then we we until we close our books we don't get a final tally of all of our property taxes and then the state has to go through some sort of a, a calculation to say okay here's what here's what you're entitled to receive based on the number of kiddos you have here's what your total revenue is and then at that point in time we'll know and we have wealth confirmation that our property taxes will be exceeding how much we would be getting from the state purely off of the, the state per pupil funding. And I assume we receive that on a quarterly basis. Now we would continue receiving that on a quarterly basis. That would continue, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. The, uh, the reason I'm asking this, and it's not approved yet, but there is an assembly bill 938 that would increase LCFF funding specifically for salaries by 50% in, in the span of seven years. And, uh, it's it's still in the works and it hasn't quite been approved yet. But I just kind of thinking about the transition time for us to having that flexibility so that we can get the most money possible based on, you know, what may not go. Through. So I'm just kind of thinking. But that's, that, that's great that you brought that up. I wasn't completely aware of all those, but I mean, from what it sounds like, I mean, th those are the types of things that could knock a district that mm -hmm. out of basic aid mm -hmm. right so those are some of the things to be th thoughtful of mm -hmm. i mean it's a huge percentage i yeah. know that our salaries um are, are the number uh, i think number one cost but that also includes the certificate and classified that also includes administration sal salaries mm -hmm. as well right mm -hmm. so i mean that could make a difference but yeah mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Jerry, do you have anything? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so first of all, thanks for following up on my request. Very much appreciated. This actually is uh, far more than what I had, uh, which is, you know, wanting to get some uh, basic numbers. And the fact that you have these uh, comparison groups and being able to do that over time, um, this is really great. I, I mean, maybe I'll just start there. I mean, as I'm looking at it, you know, one of the concerns that I see is that over time, the the gap, if we could go to that slide, which whoever one it is, uh, either with or without personnel, you know, I, I see the gap. If I look back, you know, I got on the board in 2019, and if I just look at that and I look at it now, that gap between us and then the that red line, which is, I think, the, um, is, that the is that our peer group? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Right, it's it's getting larger, and so that's that's kind of a concerning thing. I I know you know it is what it is, but it's kind of um, I guess a little bit surprising for me to see how big that gap is. Um, and and so this also allows me to run some numbers of like what would it take for us to get caught up. Um, you know, like for instance, if we go to the the other slide, the the sort of the personnel expenditures only. Um, you know, from, to kind of get from the state average to the county average, that looks like it's another, you know, 20, 30 million dollars in revenue. I think it's about 1500 per pupil times what, about 13, 12,000. So that that actually is very helpful for me, just kind of getting a sense of, um, you know, for instance, if we were to go out for a parcel tax and if we were, you know, that 8 million that we lost uh, or didn't, well, yeah, lost, I'll just use that term, um, you know, the that for me illustrates very clearly how that could help us get closer. Uh, that still wouldn't get us to the county average, but would get us a little closer. So this is really helpful. I have a lot of other thoughts, but I just wanted to thank you for following up on that. A um, couple of questions, just uh, maybe um, back to this transition to basic aid, Chris, as you talked about next year, 24, 25. So I presume the multi-year projections, uh, if I look at that chart, uh, 24, 25 and on the revenue is actually based on property tax rather than the LCFF funding model. I Correct. Want to There's back. a small part that's tied to COLA, but okay. I, some of the categorical programs, right. are mainly but property for the tax. Most so. part. Um, how far are we over? I know in the past, um, you know, we, we've, we've thought we we're going to be there and then we fall back out. I was just wondering if you had a sense of how big the margin is this time. I, I think the mm -hmm. fact that the COLA is going to be only once or right now, one something percent, that certainly lowers the bar to help us stay there. But I was just wondering. I don't have that number at my, sure. at my fingertips, but there is, there is a number. I, I, I think we have the number. Sure. Okay. But, but generally you think it's pretty 
safe that uh, we would stay, or is this going to be one of the Charlie Brown kind of things? Where, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say this uh -huh. with a one percent cola, and with our still projected decline in enrollment. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's going to force us out. I mean, we're also adding still few more kids each year due to transitional kinder. That's what's that's that is what has kept us out mm -hmm. this last year was the adding of the TK grade level. But that's because of the one percent cola not being and not being three point nine three percent. That just that just kind of lowers that bar. Right. Right. Okay. So because if you think back to last year at this time when we were projecting, I believe it was a five point two cola at that time we were projecting going into basic aid, and then when the governor came in with the eight point six or eight point two two, that set us back into LCFF. Right. Right. So the but we didn't lose as many kids at that yeah. at, at what we were projecting. So all right. Um, and then a, a different question, Tina, you mentioned uh, local donations, you know, up about 15%. Are these donations primarily to the school or to the, they're primarily the to the, so where yes, yeah, people tend to write direct that donations to their schools. directly to their schools? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. I think those are the only questions. I, I think I'm just looking at that chart thinking, you know, you, we really should be at that blue line, right? Because we're, this is a more expensive than usual area to the state. The fact that we're tracking state average is actually not a good sign. We really should be tracking at least the county average, right? So, but anyway, but thank you. Thanks for providing this visualization. Very helpful. Thanks. Okay. And I just had a couple of comments. No surprises here. I'm disappointed that we're not getting back to the reserve at 10% until 25, 26. I think that's a mistake, but it is what it is. And um, also you all know how I feel about the COLA. So I hope we're being really careful about how we budget that COLA because I, I just think it's vaporware. I think it's not gonna happen. So just for what it's worth. Okay, thanks. Aaron, public comment? No, we do not. Okay, thank you. Um, so we move on to board activity. Who would like to start? Uh, um, I can start. Eric, uh, go ahead. Uh, Sitting, go ahead. So we had a uh, wellness committee this week. The wellness committee. I was not yeah, you could not. Uh, so primarily the focus was um, student nutrition part of it. And uh, Nicole presented uh, a detailed things uh, and the uh, significant improvements what they have done. And um, I think they are trying to, there's a set of new people in that and they want to take them to schools and get more information. A lot of feedback also, good questions. And things. So that was the primary purpose. The second meeting looks pretty good, I think. What else? What else? The CSBA. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's it. Good. Thanks. Anybody else? Uh, sure. Um, I'll go next. Um, so Ava and I did um, staff office hours. Uh, we didn't actually have any attendees, um, but we talked about maybe uh, some ways to to sort of in you know uh, make it more um, attractive, I guess, for folks to so we could talk about that later. So, um, and I think there is a community office hours next Monday. I don't know who I'm doing it with, but it's on my calendar, so I'll just <laughs> advertise it here. Um, we were at the, the CSBA conference. Um, I'll just, I think for me, you know, sort of two main takeaways. One was, I think the keynote by Sal Khan talking about what's possible with um, AI technology to basically better facilitate personalized learning. I think we, you know, talk a lot about that, but until you really get to that one-to-one, -one, really hard to have it be fully personalized. And I think what's exciting is that technology has the promise of doing this. So I'm really interested in, you know, us perhaps doing some sort of a pilot. Um, and the other one is Chris already alluded to is a lot of the the fiscal outlook for the state is certainly starting to get cloudy, you know, the, and so um, yeah, I think that was, I went to several sessions and I think the the messages were fairly consistent that that's sort of like, you know, there's perhaps a turning point coming here. So, but um, I think that's, that's it for me. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thank you for talking about the off board office hours, which was yesterday at 4 p.m. Um, I also went to Mayor Hung Wei's um, coffee office hours, which was at 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning on this past Tuesday. And um, 
It's just to hear what the community is talking about, what the concerns are, and um, if they had any questions with the district, be able to help that out. And um, there were two students that, high school students um, that were concerned about like uh, recycling and how that was being done in FHUSD. And they asked mm -hmm. if we had any uh, recycling programs and said each of our schools have different stages of recycling. Um, that was the only questions that pertain to CUSD. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I um, met with Steve yesterday, I think. And um, we talked again about they're desperately looking for board members and volunteers to help with some of the things that they want to do. One of the things they're talking about is bringing back the fun run, but they don't have, or, but they don't have the volunteers to be able to pull that off. We also talked about communication and making sure that we're, we are helping them get information into the schools about Steve. We came up with some ideas that I'll share with Aaron down the road. It was a good meeting. It's always a good meeting with Steve. And then I've been starting my school visits and I was in a school this week and it was ironic because we just saw Sal Khan speak. But I was in this classroom, teacher was working with a small group and she turned to a student and she said, now you can go to the Khan Academy. So of course I went and stopped her and said, tell me a little more about this. She's doing some really creative things with the kids in terms of personalized learning. When they, the, the kids that are high flyers that don't quite fit into the lessons that she's doing, the enrichment that she's doing with them is the Khan Academy. And she was saying that it, it's really helpful for these high flyers because when they take the iReady or the other assessments that we give, there are questions that are a grade level ahead or two grade levels ahead of where they their own grade level is working. So if they're really super bright kids in math or whatever it is, the, and they're taking advantage of these and passing through these, that it's helping them to be a, ahead of the game when they take the iReady. Anyway, I was super impressed. And I told her that. So, so that was a highlight for me, was to see this teacher using the Khan Academy in, I thought, really creative ways. So that's it. Uh, Stacy, do you have anything for us? Uh, no, just I have been invited to join a group of middle school students uh, to have lunch with them at their school so I can experience lunch with them. So I told them I'd come out and eat. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be great. Great. They Very said good. they'd treat, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can't do that now. Good enough. Agenda setting. Anybody have anything for um, future agendas? I have some questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just to follow up on, and maybe because we might need more time on uh, the request from the last board meeting on uh, the board study on special education in our district. Um, and I'm assuming it just takes time gathering data. And um, how or what is the process that we do? We have a process district wide on um, where teachers can report on um, being harmed in classroom situations. Um, from the public comment, all these uh, physical things happening are mm -hmm. violations of ed code, and it makes me think. Is there a process district-wide because this creates um, trauma in the classroom, not only for the parties involved, but also the onlookers in the classroom because that's traumatizing for the students themselves and other adults in there. And how are we following through and supporting the students, not only the students and the adults with the parties involved, but in the classroom and the support staff. So, um, and I'm hoping that this process, because at the end of the day, if we have better support for our students, um, and then like it ties in if there are students in special education and um, it makes me think about manifestations and IEPs and those are the supports that help prevent and give more support to our students mm -hmm. and, and uh, preventing, hopefully preventing these things from happening. So anything else? Um, yeah, I'll just maybe add a plus one to that. I'll just, uh, I think simply for me, it's more about 
what are our policies, some of these scenarios that, that was described during public comments. Um, what are, you know, are the policies at a district level? Is that at a school level? Um, so, you know, just, just to sort of understand that I'm not really, you know, asking about preventing them, although that'd be nice. It's just, you know, some of these things you can't control, but really what happens if these events were to happen. So that's one. Um, the other one is, I, I think just in the budget, looking at Fund 63 numbers, I like to maybe get an update on Cooper Doodle and particularly the financial aspects and the plans and all that. So if we could maybe, you know, either get an update or maybe discussion about that, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Anything else for upcoming agenda? Do you have anything, City? No, I don't know. Okay. All right. With that, um, we are going to close session. Is there any public comment on closed session? No, there are not. Okay. Then we're going to adjourn for closed session.